What's going on guys, it's Simo. So as you guys know, I aim to bring you guys tons of content that's going to help you guys get better at the game regardless of your skill level. And one thing that you guys have been asking for quite a bit actually is to cover rulings. So I thought the best way to do this would actually be to invite a judge onto the channel and actually cover a lot of rulings that are going to be very relevant to you guys, whether you're attending a regional, a YCS, you know, whatever. And uh, this will be the greatest way that I could possibly give you guys as much info as possible. So for for this very first episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! Rulings You Need to Know, I'm going to introduce you guys to the one, the only, Mr. Distant Coder. How you doing, my friend? I'm good. How are you doing, Simo? I'm doing awesome. So why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself to all the fans? Uh, so hi, guys. My name is uh, Kevin, aka Distant Coder. For those that don't know me, I stream over on Twitch. I'm a Twitch streamer more than a YouTuber. YouTube is soon to come, but right now I stream over at twitch.tv slash Distant Coder. Uh, I'm a judge over on Dueling Book, which is the primary uh, platform I use for my content creation. Uh, otherwise, I am a certified RC2 judge for Konami. Uh, I have the PC1 certification as well, so all the big certifications that you need to judge at a YCS level and stuff like that. I have all of those, so I can judge YCSs if I if I want to, even though I'm Canadian and we don't get that many YCSs up here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I do have all the certification to do, like to, to judge all the YCSs and stuff like that. But I primarily just take a bunch of calls on Dueling Book. All right, so um, yeah, let's just not waste any more time and get into it. So I thought the best way to go about doing this, since this is the first episode in this series, like I said, I wanna keep it very meta relevant and that way to help you guys in matchups you're going to be facing the most commonly. And so I thought we'd go ahead and start with Orcus, since at the time of recording this video, this is still the most dominant deck of the format. So we're gonna go ahead and shift over the dueling book here, cause I thought just being able to have a, a bit of a visual representation would be useful for you guys. And we're gonna start off with good old Dengirsu here. So uh, the first thing we wanted to talk about is uh, Dengirsu's protection effect. Yeah, so Dengirsu's protection effect is uh, really unique. Uh, it, it's one of those effects that uh, has the word instead, which is very important. Uh, instead is a replacement effect. It's not an effect that activates. So Dengirsu's effect is what we call an unclassified effect, not a continuous effect. Uh, and it's an unclassified effect that allows you to protect one of your cards by detaching one of its materials. So one of the important things to note about Dengirsu's protection effect is that it's not an effect that activates. It does not start a chain. So it does just uh, resolve, in a way, in the middle of a chain. So say like your opponent's activating effect like as chain link 2 or 3 that would destroy your Dengirsu or a card on your field, you can protect in the middle of the chain by detaching a material from your Dengirsu. So that's really important to note that it's not something that can be, for example, Solemn Striped. And we know that it's not an effect that activates because it lacks a colon or a semicolon, which is what denotes that a card activates or not. Right, and then there's also some interesting interactions with uh, Dengirsu attaching its materials underneath it itself as well, correct? Uh, yeah, when it comes to attaching its materials, uh, I could give you a pretty good example. If we have like Dengirsu up with uh, Nibiru, if you want to pull that up. Yeah, there. sure. Let me go oh. ahead and uh, I can get a Nibiru here. Yeah, see, I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a, a Dingirsu on the field and like a banished uh, symbol skeleton, for example. Sure. So say say I banish symbol skeleton, summon a Dingirsu to my field, and I activate the effect of Dingirsu to attach the symbol skeleton. Say I've summoned more than five times, and you would chain your Nibiru to my Dingirsu's effect. The interaction that would happen here is that your Nibiru will resolve before my Dengirsu, sending my Dengirsu to the grave. Now where the confusion lies for a lot of people with this is that a lot of people think that Dengirsu's effect can still resolve to attach a material and that the banished symbol skeleton that I would want to attach would just be sent to the graveyard. But that's not the case. And the reason why people think this is when you take into, consider in into consideration cards like uh, Thousand Eyes Restrict, if they target a monster on the field uh, to equip it as, a, as an equip spell, and then uh, an effect is chained that pops Thousand Eyes Restrict, for example, the card that Thousand Eyes Restrict targeted would be sent to the graveyard by game mechanics because it still attempts to equip. But attaching a material here is not the, the, the same interaction. It works very differently. So for this reason, if you would Nibiru my, my Dingirsu, it would be sent to the graveyard and the symbol skeleton would remain banished. And this is really important. And it, th this is not just like an effect that would tribute it, but anything that would make the Nigirsu leave the field. So if it leaves the field in any sort of way, whatever material you wanted to attach from the Banish Zone will remain banished and will not be attached to the Nigirsu or sent right, to the graveyard. And that's just really important too, because that can affect so many different interactions that knowing that this is how it's going to work is just, that, that can be honestly game changing in a lot of instances. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. It can give you a lot of advantage. Like, if, if they're running low on resources and they need to use the Dragirisu to, like, try and get their resources back, if you can find a way to clear their Dragirisu, first of all, they can't summon another one because Dragirisu is a once per turn. Uh, it, it can only be summoned once per turn. So they won't be able to summon another one to recur those resources until the next turn. So right. you being able to clear that Dragirisu, like, literally stops them from getting their resources back. And it, it's very important to know because knowing rulings really does give you an advantage in matchups. So speaking of that, uh, and Dingirsu only being able to be revived once per turn, there was another thing we wanted to discuss was in regards yeah. to uh, DD Crow. So yeah. uh, let me go ahead and grab a DD Crow here. Yeah, go ahead and grab a DD Crow. I'm gonna dump. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna dump a World Wand to my graveyard here because sure. that's what we're gonna need for this. Okay. So say this is how my graveyard is set up. I have a Simple Skeleton, a World Wand, and a Dingirsu. Right, and I'm showing the if audience right now. Yeah, if I use the effect of the Symbol Skeleton to target my Dingirsu to Special Summon it, and you would chain DD Crow to banish my Dingirsu, the Symbol Skeleton will technically still resolve, attempting to summon the Dingirsu. That fulfills the once per turn summoning for Dingirsu. So you cannot attempt to summon Dingirsu again. So even if I have a World Wand here, even though Dingirsu wasn't successfully summoned, an attempt to summon it was still made. So I, it would be an illegal move for me to attempt to use World Wand here to summon the Nigirsu that is now banished because it was already attempted to be summoned. This is kind of the same thing as if you just attempt to summon the Nigirsu and the summon itself is negated by Solemn Strike, for example. Uh, that would also fulfill the once per turn for Nigirsu. So if like an effect would summon Nigirsu and either the effect uh, is negated or the effect doesn't successfully resolve, it still counts as an attempt to summon Dingirsu. However, the one uh, exception that we have to this rule is say, once again, I had Symbol Skeleton in my graveyard and the Dingirsu in my graveyard. If I use the effect of Symbol Skeleton and it's met with like Solemn Strike or any effect that would negate the activation of Symbol Skeleton's effect, specifically the activation, the activation of Symbol Skeleton is negated, then the Dingirsu was never attempted to be summoned, so it can you can attempt to summon another, say, from your extra deck, or if you have another one that's banished or whatever, using a World Wand, for example. Right, because DD Crow wasn't negating the Symbol Skeleton. So, it's the, like you said, the Symbol Skeleton is still resolving, and it attempted to, and any time in Yu-Gi-Oh! when there's something that's, like, attempting to do something, that typically counts towards that, um, you know, that once-per-turn type of effect. Uh, alternatively, if you consider Skullmeister, for example, Skullmeister sure. Skullmeister, is a card yeah, here. seeing a lot of play now. Yeah, Skullmeister is seeing a lot of play, and the card doesn't state that it negates the activation, it negates the effect. So same mm -hmm. situation here, if you were to negate the effect of Symbol Skeleton that's trying to revive a Dingirsu with Skullmeister, Dingirsu cannot be attempted to be summoned again because there was an attempt made to summon it, and only the effect was negated, not the activation. So you need to specifically consider a card that negates the activation such as Solemn Strike or Ghost Bell, for example, or cards like that. If they negate the activation of Symbol Skeleton, Dingirsu can be, you can't attempt to summon another Dingirsu. If the effect is negated or it just resolves unsuccessfully, then Dingirsu was still attempted to be summoned, so you cannot attempt to summon another. Okay guys, so now we're gonna talk about some of the Orcus Link monsters because there's actually a lot more depth to these than meets the eye. So uh, what are we gonna talk about with this, Kevin? Uh, one of the first things that we're actually going to talk about is uh, the conjunctions that they use when it comes to describing how the effects work for the uh, the, the Orcus monsters. So, uh, Longirsu and Galatea, for example, technically Orcustrion as well, has an effect similar to these, where they can target a banished Orcus, shuffle it into the deck, and then it specifically says, shuffle into the deck, then you can either set one Orcus spell trap directly from your deck, or send a linked monster on the field to the graveyard. What's very important to note is that when an effect effect says, then you can. You need to keep in mind that that second part of the effect is completely optional. You do not need to successfully be able to resolve that part of the effect in order to activate the effect initially. So when it comes to, for example, Galatea's effect, shuffling one banished Orcus back into the deck to set uh, an Orcus spell trap directly from your deck, you do not need to have a target in your deck, uh, an Orcus spell trap target in your deck, in order to activate this effect. So if like it's late game and a grind game, 
you're out of Orcus Returns, you're out of uh, Orcus uh, the, the Crescendo, you don't have Babel, you don't have any of these cards, none of them are in your deck, but you need to like put your Orcus resources back into your deck, you can do that with Galatea. Their main effect is just to shuffle back, and being able to set or being able to send is only an additional effect that they have that is optional. So you do not need to be able to do it, nor do you have to do it even if you have a target. Right, so let's say, it's yeah, so let's say for instance, like you need to, like if you want to get an Orcus monster back into your deck, because let's say you have a Harp and Grave, but all your targets are banished, you could just shuffle one back into your deck with Begalatea, and then if you can sh uh, use them, banish the Harp to special summon, and that way, it's like you said, you don't need any other targets, but you just want to get that monster back into your deck. That's actually cost me a game at YCS London, because I didn't <laughs> know that, so um, I think this is actually very key for a lot of players. I think it's going to be in very late game grindy situations, but it's still very relevant nonetheless. Yeah, it is something that can come up, and a lot of people will, like, when I take a lot of calls on Dueling Book, a lot of times people will have a Long Gears to and activate the effect because they want to shuffle two back, and then their opponent says, well, there's no linked monsters on the field, so you can't resolve that effect. But when a card effect says then, something then you can, only the only part A must be something that you can resolve. So, of course, if you don't have any banished Orcus, you can't activate the effect initially. But if you only can resolve the A, por the a portion of the effect, but not the B portion, you only do A, and and you don't need to do B because it's a then you can. The conjunction is very important here. So let's go ahead and talk about the extreme version of this, which uh, incorporates orchestrated Babel here being active. Yeah, that, that's a very good one. Okay, so say for example, like your current situation, you have a lot of banished Orchest cards uh, and you control Longirisu and Galatea. Say, for example, you wanted to resolve both the effects of Longirisu and Galatea. Currently, you have four banished Orchest. If you had two, yeah. you would still be able to resolve both of them. Here's how you would go about it. You would activate Longirisu's effect first, and you would target both, because they, they both have to, both Galatea and Longirisu need to target banished Orcus monsters. So say you activate Longirisu, and you target both of your banished Harp Horrors, in order to send, for example, my Symbol Skeleton that's linked to, to your Longirisu. Uh, you would be able to, since you have Babel, activate as Chainlink 2, Galatea, targeting one of your two Orcus Harp Horrors. And as we all know, a chain resolves backwards, so you would be able to shuffle one of the, the Harp Horror that Galatea targeted, shuffle that one back into the deck, resolve the effect of Galatea, for example, setting an Orcus Crescendo, and then after that happens, your Longirisu would still resolve, shuffling as many targets as possible that are still remaining, and as long as it shuffled at least one card, you can still resolve the second part of the effect. You don't need to successfully shuffle back the two cards you targeted, you only need to successfully shuffle back one. And this is a game changer because like you can get the value from both monsters with minimal resources here. And so again, like a lot of people may not know that, so I think it's actually a very good thing that you know you're uh, uh, showing this to people. Yeah, so the way, because of, it's specifically because of the way that it's worded. Because Longirisu specifically says shuffle them into the deck and not shuffle those targets into the deck, it can still work. Same as how, like, uh, Disciples of the True Draco Phoenix, if you target three Draco cards in your graveyard to draw one, and one of them gets DD Crowed, for example, you still shuffle the other two and draw one. So when a card says shuffle them into the deck, you only need to shuffle one to successfully resolve the second part of the effect whereas if it said those targets or shuffle both into the deck or something like that then you wouldn't be able to because you didn't successfully resolve all of the uh a portion of the effect in order to do the b portion all right, guys, so just to wrap up the video here, we have a few more, I guess, miscellaneous type rulings that uh, seem really innocuous, but actually matter a lot. And you're going to love to know these tips. So uh, what do you got for us, Kevin? Okay, so one of the first ones that I'm going to be talking about is uh, Orcus Crescendo. Orcus Crescendo is a very, very unique card in the sense that it's, uh, it's a counter trap on the field. But when you use its effect in the graveyard, you need to keep in mind that it is a spell speed 2 effect, therefore a quick effect. It can be used at any point during any, either player's main phase, either player's standby phase, and stuff like that, so long as you haven't used the first effect, of course, because you can only use one of the effects per turn. One thing that's really important to keep in mind about Crescendo is that, first of all, it has a different restriction to all your other Orcus cards. So other Orcus cards lock you into darks, whereas Orcus Crescendo locks you into dark machines, and it considers your entire turn, not just the rest of this turn. So if before using Crescendo's Grave effect, you have summon, you have special summon, say, Dark Greffer, for example, you wouldn't be allowed to legally activate the uh, second effect of Orcus Crescendo in the graveyard because you've summoned a non-machine dark monster. 
So that's one tip that's very important to keep in mind. The other tip that's important to keep in mind is that its graveyard effect is a quick effect. However, even though it is a counter trap, a counter trap, if it has a graveyard effect, the graveyard effect is spell speed two, not spell speed three. So your opponent can respond to your Orcus Crescendo with say an Ash Blossom. Whereas we know that on the field, uh, a counter trap cannot be responded to by anything other than a counter trap. Right. So that's one thing that's very important to keep in mind is you cannot, uh, if your opponent activates a, a Orcus Crescendo in the graveyard's effect, you can Ash Blossom it. You, you, like if they tell you, if they try to tell you, oh no, it's a counter trap, it's spell speed three, you can only chain with a counter trap, that's incorrect. That is not true. Right, and that's really important because that's something I didn't even know because there's so few cards that this actually like comes up. So I think that's definitely a good one for sure. Yeah, that is a, a bit of a rare one. Now, we're going to go into a couple of more uh, niche things, but that can come up and that are really interesting when you uh, when you take them into consideration. Uh, the one I'm going to be talking about now is Nibiru Chaining Orcus Nightmare. So say, for example, I'm going to summon a bunch of guys because I've, I've popped off this turn. I, I've, I'm, I'm going for game. Did I, sum I summon the Gizmec, dude. I have a Phantasme. I don't know. Like You specialed a, a Link from Grave or something. I've summoned more than five times. And you decide to activate Nibiru the Primal Being in your hand. But at this point, you, you also don't want to give me a really, really big token. You want to make sure that I, you just want to clear my board, I can't keep playing, and you want to lock me out of all my stuff. What you can do if you have orchestrated Babble Up, for example, is activate Nibiru the Primal Being as Chainlink 1, and then chain with the Orcus Nightmare that you have in the graveyard, targeting, for example, your Dengirsu here. And the way that chain will resolve, because it resolves backwards, you resolve the effect of Orcus Nightmare, setting an Orcus from your deck to the graveyard, and locking yourself into Dark Monsters, and the interaction that that creates with Nibiru, who is a light monster, who's already activated its effect, will be the following. Because Nibiru is an and if you do effect, the way those work is that when you initially activate the card, you need to be able to resolve parts A and B of the effect, but uh, which you could do because you hadn't previously activated an orchestra like card in your graveyard prior in the turn, pre previously in the turn. Uh, but if you did activate Nibiru as Chainlink 1 and then Chain Orcus Nightmare, you're then locked into Darks as Chainlink 2. And then once you go as Chainlink 1 to resolve your Nibiru, you resolve as much as possible. So you will resolve part A of Nibiru's effect, which is tribute all monsters on the field, but you will not successfully uh, do part B of Nibiru's effect because you cannot summon a light monster. So for that reason, what it'll do, what it, the, the, the dynamic that it creates is that it'll wipe the entire field, all monsters on the field will be tributed, but the Nibiru that you had in hand will remain in your hand. So you get to save it for a later turn if you want to wipe once again. Yeah, which is crazy because it's a recursive board wipe as long as you have Babble Up and you have at least any Orcus and Grave that you can use at spell speed too, which is crazy because having that level of interaction, it's really, you know, just imposing on your opponent because it's like, as long as you can do that, it's like they're not getting through and you can continuously use it over and over and over again. Yeah, they know that you have the Nibiru, so they know that they can't overextend because otherwise you're wiping their entire field and you can even keep it if you have other Orcus cards in the grave. Another thing that's important to note is that, like I said, Orcus Crescendo is a spell speed 2 effect in the graveyard. So even if you don't have Babble Up, but you have Crescendo in the grave and you activate Nibiru as Chainlink 1, you can activate Orcus Crescendo as Chainlink 2, which will lock you into Dark Machines, meaning that the same interaction with Nibiru will happen. It'll wipe the entire field, but Nibiru won't be summoned and will remain in your hand. And so there was one last little thing that uh, a lot of people, it's, it's probably the most like underutilized and underappreciated effect of Orcus Nightmare, but uh, it actually can matter a lot. And that is uh, Orcus Nightmare and the damage step. Yeah, so the damage step is a very interesting step in Yu-Gi-Oh. People, a lot of people don't like the damage step because they don't understand it. So in the damage step, what we know is that you can only activate uh, mandatory effects, you can only activate counter traps, and you can only activate effects that either negate activation of cards or effects, and cards that directly impact the stats of a monster on the field. So when, say for example, you would enter your battle phase, and you attack into my Dengirsu, what would happen is that during the damage step, specifically before damage calculation, which is one of the substeps of the damage step, during before damage calculation, you would be able to use the effect of your Orcus Nightmare, which is a quick effect thanks to Babel, to target your Dingirsu and dump an Orcus monster from your deck, also increasing the attack of your Dingirsu. What's important to note here is that because it's a damage step, your opponent cannot chain something like Ash Blossom or something like Skullmeister or DD Crow or anything like that in the damage step because those effects don't negate activations. 
they only negate effects. So for that reason, you can pretty much guarantee that your Orcus Nightmare is going through. And if you have Babble up, you can like do this in the damage step because you want to make sure, okay, I need my harp to go. I, I need a harp in the grave, for example. And you can still use your harp afterwards after the damage step is done while you're still in battle phase. So you can still go and like attack again. Or if you dump a skeleton, you can revive like a long Girisu and attack with that or something like that. So that's something really interesting to note is that if you want to play around those hand traps, you can use Orcus Nightmare's effect in the graveyard in order to dump and gain attack. So it's really And you can also use defensively as well. So if your opponent's trying to get over your monsters and damage step you could banish the nightmare and you could bolster the stats of your own monster so that way their monster dies and yours will remain on the field as well so it even works in the reciprocating fashion too exactly yeah. same yeah. thing exactly yeah like and that. excuse me for i was attempting to demonstrate attacking but uh, apparently dueling book doesn't want to cooperate so but anyway uh <laughs> guys that's gonna wrap up this first episode of Yu Gi Oh rulings you need to know uh let me know down in the comments what you guys think and if you enjoyed this new series is something that kevin and i were talking about for a past few weeks now and uh i think it came out pretty good uh i hope you guys enjoyed it and learned something because i know i sure did uh kevin any final thoughts not really dude just uh enjoy wrecking orcas players now that you know all the rulings dude yeah Exactly. <laughs> so guys, thank you so much for watching the video. We'll see you next time.